Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. This is the HRC Law Class. I'm your brother, Kasafo. And I'm your brother, Zakwa. Hope you all are enjoying the day. Today, we're going to be discussing the Old Covenant and the New Covenant to understand both. Let's jump right into it. You ready to go, Zakwa? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Can we start at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 2, please? The Lord our Elohim made a covenant with us in Horeb. So this is to understand a covenant. A covenant and testament in the Greek text is the same word. In the Greek text, we get edification on covenants that a testator, which is a person who made the covenant, must die to make a covenant they made have force, which happens after they die. Can you read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16? For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Right. A testament in G1242 is properly a disposition. That is specifically a contract, especially a divisory will. Covenant, testament. So in layman terms, it's an agreement. So in regards to a covenant, it's a contract that requires the death of a testator to give the words of it force. The reason being, can you read Hebrews 9 and 17, please? For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Just like a last will of a man is enforced after he dies, so also, someone has to die to make the covenant of force. The first covenant was a shadow of the good things to come to help us understand. Can you read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 18, please? Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So, evidence that someone has to die for a covenant to be of force is shown in the fact that blood was used to dedicate the first covenant. To help us understand, someone has to die to enforce a covenant. Mm -hmm. Continue reading, please. But when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which Elohim hath enjoined unto you. So the blood of the first covenant was calves and goats to enforce all the words spoken by Moses written in the book and enjoin the people unto the words of Allah I am written in the book. Mark in your notes that no testator died to make the words of the covenant of force yet. It's going to come together in due time, or you already understand what we're about to see. For now, let's continue understanding what Paul was teaching about the blood of a covenant. Verse 22, please. And almost all things about the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So, according to the law, that blood was supposed to purge the conscience of the people for remission of their former transgressions, so they could go forward in the covenant and keep the words of the covenant made with Allah Hayyam. That's what Paul was explaining to the Galatians about why the law of animal sacrifice was added to the law of the commandments. Can you read Galatians 3 and 19, please? Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. See that the law he is referring to is to the sacrifices added to the commandments in the law because of the transgressions of the commandments. Specifically, the sacrifices of the Day of Atonement was added to forgive sins yearly. You can understand some of the law of the commandments had to have already existed for the people to be in transgression and to have the need for remission of sins by the blood of the law of sacrifices. Let's continue seeing why the law of sacrifices of blood for remission of sins was added. It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Remember, a testator needs to die for a testament to have force? Hence, the law of sacrifices were just added because of our transgressions until Christ, the promised seed, shall come to die for the covenant, give his blood to purge Israel, 
and to make an atonement for the remission of sins and make the words of the covenant of force. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So the law given with sacrifices added were ordained by angels in the hand of Moses, the mediator. Understand that the law of remission for sin by the blood of sacrifices had to be added to the law in order for Christ's sacrifice and blood to be able to fulfill the law to atone for sins by it. Can you read Hebrews 9 and 22, please? And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Therefore, had not the law of sacrifices to purge with blood for remission of sins not been added, Christ himself, his sacrifice and blood could not have purged us because there would have been no law to make it righteous or no covenant to bind us to the law. Thus, truly, the sacrifices were just given until Christ, the seed to whom the promises were made, should come, fulfill the law of purging by blood for remission of sins according to the law of sacrifices and make the covenant of force. Thus, the law of sacrifices was truly a schoolmaster to teach us and prepare us to be able to be atoned for and understand what Christ would do for us to believe we would be justified by faith in it rather than seeking to be justified by the works and deeds of animal sacrifice for remission of sins. Can you read Galatians 3 and 24, please? Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Amen. I have promised Christ he would be with him and give him for a covenant of Israel so that his blood would be the blood of the covenant instead of bulls and goats. Can you read Isaiah 42 and 6, please? I, Ahiah, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Christ was called to be given for a covenant for the people Israel and for a light to the Gentiles. He did have to die for Israel because of our transgressions to make atonement and remission of our sins by the law with his blood so that he could turn us away from iniquity. Can you read Matthew 15 and 24, please? But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's because he had to be given for a covenant of the people. Hopefully now you understand why he was saying that. Can you read Acts 3 and 26, please? Unto you first, Elohim, having raised up his son, Yache, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That blessing was to remit our sins by his blood and turn us from our iniquities back unto obedience to the covenant. Yet remember, he also was given for a light to the Gentiles. So let's see what his sacrifice and blood for Israel and shedding light to the Gentiles would do. Can you read Isaiah 42 and 7, please? To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Thus, when Christ would come to replace the law of sacrifices added because of transgressions with himself and his own blood, for all nations it would open eyes to the light, bring prisoners from the prison, and those in darkness of the law of the devil out of his prison house to take hold of the first covenant of Allah Hayyam. Paul was ordained to minister of the light of the Lord unto Israel and the Gentiles to turn all who have faith in Yache from the darkness of the law of the devil unto the light of the law of Allah by faith in Christ. Can you read Acts 26 verse 17 and 18, please? Mm -hmm. Delivering thee from the people. That's the 12 tribes of the Hebrew race. And from the Gentiles. That's every other race of people. Unto whom now I send thee. 
So Paul was sent on to all nations. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto Elohim, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And thus you have all nations that are sanctified by faith that is in Yahche have this opportunity. And the light to the Gentiles also opened up for the Gentiles to join themselves unto Ahaya to take hold of the covenant. Can you read Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7, please? Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves unto Ahaya to serve him and to love the name of Ahaya to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. You see the Gentiles, when they see the light of Christ, they will love the name Ahaya, embrace being his servants, keep his Sabbath in truth from the heart, not doing any iniquity to keep from polluting it, and take hold of his covenant, just like the true seed of Israel. Ahaya has a reward for all nations that embrace the light of Christ to take hold of his covenant in the kingdom to abide by his commandments. Okay, please. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar. For mine house shall be called in house of prayer for all people. There you have the end goal and reward for taking hold of the covenant. It's for all nations that do so to be brought to Zion in the kingdom of Christ and have joy there with Christ and all who've made it where everyone's sacrifices according to the law of sacrifices will be accepted. You can see that the first covenant was to help prepare us for the kingdom of Christ through Christ's work that Allah Hayim ordained for him to do by the fact that even the Gentiles have to take hold of the covenant to be brought to the holy hill. The prophets were prophesying of the second coming of Christ and how he would prepare even the sons of Levi for the priesthood during his approach so they can be where he needs them to be, to do right in his kingdom and offer those burnt offerings and sacrifices that all nations would be bringing to Zion. Can you read Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 to 4, please? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. John the Baptist would be sent to prepare the way before Allah. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. The Lord Christ Yache, who those who take hold of the covenant are seeking, shall come in the end of this world. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Hold on. Did you notice Yache Christ is the messenger of the covenant as well? He is the testator that must die to make it a force, and he is the sacrifice given for a covenant as well. We also get understanding of those who are seeking him as well by the fact that it's those who delight in him and know he is the messenger of the covenant Allah Hayyam had given in Horeb. Continue, please. Behold, he shall come saith Ahiah of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. As the world draws closer to its end, Christ is getting closer. And the closer he gets, the more there will be a purging like fire and soap. So afflictions will come to get those that seek him and delight in him right to obey him. Most of all, the sons of Levi, so that the sacrifices in his kingdom will be in righteousness. Continue reading, please. He shall sit as the refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto a higher an offering in righteousness. Not only will the tribe of Levi be purified to offer sacrifices in the kingdom, before the end of this world, 
they will be delivered from the spirits of pride and wickedness that attend upon them through Lord Yache. They shall offer sacrifices of praise, giving thanks to Allah Hayim. As he reads in Hebrews 13 and 15, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to Allah Hayim continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Through Allah Hayim working in them, they shall also keep the law and take heed to the commandments as living sacrifices unto Allah Hayim, as it speaks of in Sirach 35, verse 1 to 7, it reads, He that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. He that taketh heed to the commandment offereth a peace offering. He that requiteth a good turn offereth fine flour. And he that giveth alms sacrificeth praise. To depart from wickedness is a thing pleasing to the Lord, and to forsake unrighteousness is a propitiation. Thou shalt not appear empty before the Lord. For all these things are to be done because of the commandment. Thus, when the tribe is righteous, it will also make the sacrifices accepted before the Most High, and their prayers for the people will be accepted. Continuing in verse 6, The offerings of the righteous make it the altar fat, and the sweet savor thereof is before the Most High. The sacrifice of a just man is acceptable, and the memorial thereof shall never be forgotten. Hopefully that helps understand what Yahche is doing in Malachi 3 and 3. Let's continue back in Malachi 3 and 4 so we can see what Yahche purifying the sons of Levi will bring about. Continue reading, please. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto Ahiah, as in the days of old, and as in former years. Thus, the Levites will be purified from our struggles through afflictions as Christ's day draws closer, and the 12,000 that are purified will make it into the kingdom to offer sacrifices for all nations in the house of Allah Hayim, along with the Levites that had fallen asleep in righteousness of old time. The covenant of the Levites being ministers to do the service of Allah Hayim is a covenant that cannot be broken just as the covenant of David's seed to be on the throne. Can you read Jeremiah 33, verse 17 to 22, please? For thus saith Ahiah, David shall never want a man that sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. We know Yahshua is the king of Israel, everlasting, according to Psalms 45, verse 6 and 7. So that covenant to David cannot be undone. Continue, please. Neither shall the priest of the Levites want a man before me to offer burnt offerings, and to kindle meat offerings, and to do sacrifice continually. Even so, the Levites will do sacrifice before Allah continually, after the tribe is purified. And the word of Ahiah come unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith Ahiah, If ye can break my covenant of the day, and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be a day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. That's pretty straightforward. We see day and night, those covenants with either tribes or families aren't broken. Keep in mind, the Levites have a covenant to be priests, his ministers offering sacrifices, but Allah Hayim didn't say that they would be high priests continually. It's important for when we get further into understanding the changes in the priesthood later. Continue, please, bro. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. So the seed of David and Levi shall be multiplied in the kingdom. As Enoch prophesied, the righteous will have thousands of children. And the covenant of kingship for David and the service of priesthood to offer sacrifices continually for Levi cannot be broken. All this is helpful for understanding the first covenant and the New Testament and the priesthood and what changes are being made 
and what's to come in the end of this world and the next world of Christ's kingdom. Thus far, we have seen that those who delight in Christ are seeking him, and those who take hold of the covenant to keep it will be filled with joy in the kingdom. Let's understand the covenant given to know what we need to take hold of for our hope of joy. Let's jump into that, understanding the first covenant. Let's see how the first covenant happened and what all the words of it were to make the covenant. Can you read Exodus 24, verse 5 and 8, please? Exodus chapter 24, verse 5. And he sent young men to the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto Ahia. Exodus 24 and 8. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which Ahia has made with you concerning all these words. The blood of those animals was sprinkled upon us to make the covenant between us and Allah concerning these words. Let's see what the words were concerning that covenant that we were enjoined to by the blood of animals. Can you read Exodus 19, verse 3 through 6, please? Moses went up unto Allah and Ahiah called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So far, we see we were offered that if we obey his voice and keep the covenant he is making with us, we shall be a peculiar treasure unto him and his priests and the holy nation. Yet he said more pertaining to this covenant. Can you read Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 1 to 5, please? The word that came to Jeremiah from Ahiah saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And say thou unto them, Thus saith Ahiah Elohim of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant, which I command your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do them, according to all which I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your Elohim. Even as Paul said, to whom ye yield yourselves to obey, his servants we are. So, obeying our Hayah voice and doing what he says will make us also his people and him our Allah by evidence of our obedience. Thus far, we actually have to obey his voice and keep his covenant by doing what he says to become his people, his peculiar treasure, his priests, and holy nation as Allah Hayyam holds us accountable to hold up our end of the bargain. He wants us to obey the covenant for a reason as well. Can you read verse 5, please? That I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Ahiah. He has an oath he must uphold that requires our obedience to fulfill it. Can you read 2 Corinthians 10 and 6, please? And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled. The devil is aware that Allah is waiting on our obedience to his voice to walk in the covenant of his law. Can you read Testament of Dan, chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, please? Therefore, is the enemy eager to destroy all that call upon the Lord? The devil knows there is power in the true name of Christ to depart from iniquity, like Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and 19, 
And Zakwa mentioned in the last law class that it's belief on the name Yache and his spirit that helps come out of iniquity. So the devil attacks those that call upon it because he knows what it will bring about. Continue, please. For he knoweth that upon the day on which Israel shall repent, the kingdom of the enemy shall be brought to an end. There you see confirmation of what calling on the true name Yache will do by bringing us to repentance, to go forward and obey Elohim's voice and be obedient, to do what he said to do in his commandments, so that he will fulfill the oath to our fathers and revenge all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled to destroy the kingdom of the enemy. Knowing all this, let's see the oath made to our fathers so we can understand why we have to do it, why we have to do the covenant for him to fulfill it. Jasher 47, verse 7, please. And Isaac called Jacob and his sons, and they all came and sat before Isaac. And Isaac said unto Jacob, The Lord Elohim of the whole earth said unto me, Unto thy seed will I give this land for an inheritance, if thy children keep my statutes and my ways. And I will perform unto them the oath which I swore unto thy father Abraham. Now therefore, my son, teach thy children and thy children's children to fear the Lord and to go in the good way, which pleases the Lord that I am. For if you keep the ways of the Lord and his statutes, the Lord will also keep unto you his covenant with Abraham and will dwell with you and your seed all the days. There we have understanding. If thy children keep my statutes and my ways, and I will perform unto them the oath which I swore unto thy father Abraham. He's upholding that. Isaac was speaking to Jacob and all his sons. The covenant was spoken even before sacrifices were established for the atonement of the Day of Atonement. And hopefully the faithful who understands these things can see why we have to do the covenant. And even in the ancient times, the faithful understood those things. They agreed to Ahaya's covenant to obey his voice, that he may be our Ahayim and dwell with us and keep the oath to our father Abraham. Can you read Exodus 19, verse 7 and 8, please? And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which Ahaya commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that Ahiah has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto Ahiah. Thus, the children of Israel are bound by the words exchanged between our fathers and Elohim to fulfill all the words that Ahiah has spoken, to obey his voice, that he may fulfill the oath to our fathers when our obedience is fulfilled. Can you read Gadesia chapter 9, verse 10, please? And therefore we have to obey the whole law, for we were commanded by the name, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. Thus we can confirm our obligation to obey the whole law. Let's see Ahia's response to the agreement of our fathers to obey his voice and do whatever he says. Exodus 19 and 9, please. And Ahia said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee. In response, he came to speak so that we may know what he wants us to obey since we agreed. Continue, please. And believe thee forever. Also, it's important to see he wanted us to believe Moses because we need to believe and listen to him in order to believe and listen to Christ. Can you read John 5 verse 47 and then verse 46, please? John chapter 5, verse 47. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? John 5 and 46. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Moses spake the word of Allah, and Christ speaks the word the Father gave him to speak. Therefore, if one does not believe the writings of Moses in the Old Testament, one cannot believe in Christ's words to do them as they come from the same source. Thus from the days of the covenant in Horeb 
Elohim was preparing us for faith and obedience to Christ by obeying Moses' words and writings. Let's continue seeing the words agreed to in the first covenant. Exodus 19, verse 19, please. And the highest said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the word to the people unto Ahia. Let's see what else Moses did when Ahia came unto the people in the mount. Deuteronomy 5 and 5, please. I stood between Ahia and you at that time, and showed you the word of Ahia. For ye were afraid by reason of the fire, and went not up into the mount. So Moses stood as a mediator between Elohim and mankind in the first covenant to relay the words of the covenant to us. Now, after Christ gave his life, he became the mediator between Elohim and man. Hence, there was more punishment to come for disobedience since a greater than Moses is here. Can you read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28 and 29? And then verse 26 and 27 and jump to verse 30, please. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall ye be thought worthy, who have trodden under foot the son of Elohim, and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and have done despite unto the spirit of grace. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. So, to sin willfully after Christ gave his blood for the covenant and the grace we have to get to obedience before his day of return comes, leaves no sacrifice for sins. And instead of two or three witnesses killing the person, it's the Lord who will recompense us for our offenses now instead of men. Verse 31, please. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. Knowing the seriousness of this covenant, let's see the words Elohim came and spake for us to obey out of respect for the blood of Christ. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 4, up to verse 31, please? Deuteronomy 5, verse 4. Ahiah taught with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire, saying, I am Ahiah the Elohim, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other Elohim before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, Ahiah the Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And thou shalt not take the name of Ahiah the Elohim in vain, for Ahiah will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as Ahiah the Elohim hath commanded thee, Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Ahiah the Elohim. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy men servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy man servant and thy maid servant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that Ahiah the Elohim brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore Ahiah the Elohim commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. 
honor thy father and thy mother as Ahaya the Elohim hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land which Ahaya the Elohim giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. These words are how you spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. So that's what he spake and wrote for Moses, yet. Let's see, was that all the words of the covenant? Continue, please. And it came to pass, when ye heard the voice out of the midst of darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that you came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And ye said, Behold, Ahaya our Elohim hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. And we have seen this day that Elohim doeth talk with man, and he liveth. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of Ahiah our Elohim any more, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that have heard the voice of the living Elohim speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Go thou near. And hear all that Ahiah our Elohim shall say, and speak thou unto us all that Ahiah our Elohim shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. So there was more words to hear than just the Ten Commandments in order for us to obey his voice, to do his words, to be his people. Our fathers agreed to obey his voice. They agreed to the Ten Commandments, and they agreed to hear and do whatever else Elohim would tell unto Moses. Let's see Elohim's response. Continue reading, please. Deuteronomy 5 and 28. And Ahiah heard the voice of your words when you spake unto me. And Ahiah said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. All right, verse 30. Go say to them, get you into your tents again. But as for thee, stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess it. There are also more commandments than just the ten, along with statutes and judgments for us to do. Moses told us all these things for a covenant. Can you read Exodus chapter 24, verse 3 and 4, please? And Moses came and told the people all the words of Ahiah and all the judgments. There we see it's Ahiah's words and judgments, not just Ten Commandments. Continue, please. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Ahiah have said, we will do. We agree to the words of Ahiah. And his judgments we heard first. Continue, please. And Moses wrote all the words of Ahiah. Then Moses wrote it all down for us. So even in the first covenant, faith came by hearing, and our heart needed to be right with Elohim, to fear him and to believe and keep his commandments always so that it will be well with us. Can you read Deuteronomy 5 and 29, please? Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that I might be well with them and with their children forever. So in the first covenant, Moses spake every precept that Ahiah told him. We heard and agreed. Then he wrote it down in the book of the law and sprinkled us and the book to enjoin us unto the covenant with Ahiah, Alahayim, to obey his voice and do his commandments, statutes, and judgments. Hebrews 9 and 19 and 20, please. 
For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which Allah hath enjoined unto you. Right. Hopefully that helps for understanding what the covenant that was made and the words of it were. Now, let's get into seeing why was the first covenant not perfect? So we have understanding of the first covenant in Horeb as we went over, but let's look at why was it not perfect? Hebrews 8 and 7, please. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. The first covenant was not without fault, so something was wrong, hence a second covenant had to be sought for. What was the fault? Hebrews 10 verse 4 and verse 1, please. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Hebrews 10 and 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The sacrifice of animals and their blood being unable to take away sins or make us perfect was the fault in the first covenant that required a disannulling or canceling or making void of these carnal commandments that were not profitable to us. Hebrews 7, verse 18 and 19, please. But there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect. Thus we see the law that made nothing perfect was referring to the sacrifices and blood of animals for taking away sins to make us perfect. And these commandments have to be disannulled because of the weakness and unprofitableness of them. The words that we agree to in the covenant that Moses wrote down for laws and testimonies for us could make us perfect on the other hand. To help understand, when Paul says the disannulling of the commandment, he was not referring to the commandments, statutes, and judgments, but merely the carnal commandments of sacrifices of animals. Can you read 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, please? All scripture is given by inspiration of Allah and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we see, the scriptures are good for guidance to be perfect unto all good works. So this, the words of Elohim are not disannulled. It's just the carnal ordinances of the sacrifices imposed on Israel until the time of reformation of the priesthood by changing the high priests and sacrifices for atonement. All right. Can you read Hebrews 7 and 11, please? If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. The people received the law of the Day of Atonement under the Levitical priesthood, wherein Aaron's children as high priests atoned for themselves and the people on that day. Hebrews 9, verse 9, verse 10, and chapter 10, verse 1, please. Right. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9 which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. This is the stuff that the priest had to do so you can understand what he's talking about because it was a shadow. Continue verse 10 and 1, please. Right, so the priests were doing all these things and it couldn't make them perfect. Thank you. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So not only does it not make the priests that did all the sacrifices and washings and stuff perfect, 
also the sacrifices and offerings under the order of Aaron couldn't make the congregation who partook in them perfect in conscience either. Paul reasoned with us on this fact. Continue in Hebrews 10, verse 2 to 4, please. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. He's speaking of the Day of Atonement sacrifices. Right? For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. The blood of bulls and goats being unable to purge the conscience and take away sins shows that the Levitical priesthood under Aaron was not perfect, so the sacrifices and blood sprinkled of the covenant was the fault found that could not purge the conscience from sin to walk in newness of life. And for these reasons, another order of high priests and offerings had to be taught to correct things. Let's see what change is made by the order of Melchizedek. Can you read Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, please? Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High Elohim. Now, why is this important? Melchizedek was king and priest of the people. So Yahshua Christ, through the law, to fulfill all righteousness, could be the high priest, being from the tribe of Judah, according to the law. Though he may not be of the tribe of Levi to be a priest, the law does not prohibit him from being a priest and king to fulfill the covenant by Allah Hayim's law after the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. And for historical reference, that Melchizedek in Genesis 14 and 18 was Shem. You can refer to the book of Joshua for that. Let's continue in Hebrews 7 and 11, please. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? The atonement made by the high priest under the order of Aaron didn't bring perfection by the weakness of the sacrifices, so it was needful for another order of high priests to arise. There you have the two orders of high priests, under Aaron or under Melchizedek. And you've seen, we've seen how the sacrifices were preparing us for Christ. And also you see how Melchizedek, the order of king and priest, was also preparation for Christ's coming. For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity, a change also of the law. The order of Melchizedek also makes changes to the laws of sacrifice and offerings, since the law of sacrifice and offerings under the order of Aaron could not purge the conscience or make us perfect. Let's look at what priest under the order of Aaron did under the first covenant. Hebrews 8 verse 3 through 5, please. But every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of Elohim when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So the tabernacle? And the offerings the priests were doing was an example and shadow of heavenly things that angels do. Hebrews 9 verse 1 through 8, please. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, 
wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot speak particularly. But when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of Elohim. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. These divine services were performed on the Day of Atonement by the high priest after the order of Aaron in the worldly sanctuary that was made in similitude to the heavenly tabernacle. The reason all this was done was by the Holy Spirit. Can you read verse 8, please? The Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The Levitical priesthood under the order of Aaron's seed as high priest was by the Holy Spirit to signify that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest in the heavens until the time of reformation, when Christ, Yache, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, will enter into the holiest of all in heaven. Can you continue verse 11, 12, and then jump to 24, please? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. His tabernacle of his own body is better than the worldly sanctuary that the children of Aaron made offerings in. Continue, please. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Elohim for us. The changing of the law in the Levitical priesthood under the order of Melchizedek is that Christ, the high priest, offered his blood in the holy place of the sanctuary in heaven for atonement of all as opposed to the worldly sanctuary with animals' blood under Aaron. Yache offers intercession for them that believe in him instead of sacrifices and offerings of animals under Aaron. That's the change of the law since there has been a change to the order of the high priest. Hebrews 7 and 25 through 27, please. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto Elohim by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. His blood and intercession for us can save us since he ever lives as opposed to the blood of animals that was unprofitable to our salvation, because the animal would die and could no longer be an intercession between us and Elohim. For such an high priest became us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. That's the difference between the law of sacrifices under the order of Melchizedek, who offered himself once, as opposed to the order of Aaron, who has to offer sacrifices daily of bulls and goats that, that can't purge their conscience or the people's conscience. And it makes the law of sacrifices after the order of Melchizedek a greater sacrifice to help us serve Allah. Can you read Hebrews 9, verse 13 and 14, please? But if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to Allah? Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim. Romans 3 and 25. Whom Elohim has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood 
to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of Elohim. The law of sacrifices under the order of Melchizedek purges our conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim, taking away the guilty conscience of former sins to be able to move forward in the faith by belief in Christ's blood to propitiate for us and his bloodless offering of intercession in the heavens for us to strengthen us out of our struggles during this grace that we have to help obey the covenant. Thus you have the changing of the law of sacrifices and offerings under the order of Melchizedek to an offering of Christ's blood in the heavenly sanctuary once for the purging of the conscience and offerings of intercessions being made before Elohim continually for the perfecting of the saints instead of the cardinal ordinances and blood of bulls and rams being offered by the law under the order of Aaron that could not purge the conscience of making anyone perfect. Yet remember, the law of carnal ordinances and sacrifices had to be added to the commandments in order to prepare us as a schoolmaster for the work Christ was to come and do, so that when he would establish the law of faith in his blood, instead of the law of works in animal sacrifices and carnal ordinances, we would no longer need to do the carnal ordinances and sacrifices through our faith in Christ. Can you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 to 26, please? Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. This should be easily understood now, that the law of sacrifices and blood for remission of sins was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ to be justified by faith in his blood. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of Elohim by faith in Christ Yache. Hopefully that helps understand the change to the law after the order of Melchizedek is faith in the blood of Christ and his intercession for us to purge our hearts and strengthen us to obey the voice of Elohim as opposed to the law of sacrifices under the order of Aaron that was faulty in that the sacrifices and blood of animals couldn't take away sin or make us perfect. With all that, is the first covenant done away? Understanding this and remembering a testament has no force while a testator lives, we can begin to understand by Christ offering himself, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Can you read Hebrews 9 verse 17 and then verse 15, please? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 17. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Take notice that redemption from transgressions by the law of the sacrifice comes up here. Remember the law of sacrifices of animals was added to the law because of transgressions in Galatians 3? Thus, we have an opportunity to understand these things as a whole. In the first covenant, the law of animal sacrifice, though it couldn't purge the conscience or take away sins, it was added because of transgressions to atone for sins as a schoolmaster to prepare us until the promised seed shall come to fulfill the atonement needed to truly establish the covenant because a covenant is not a force until someone dies. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I guess I want to, let me give a quick dichotomy. Um, we learn like in the world, right? Like when you see people end up actually making a covenant with the devil, usually one of their family dies when they have to make that covenant because someone has to die. The blood has to be shed or a blood pact has to be made to make a covenant. So you see usually like someone, their son, their child would die or their mother or their friend or their father 
somebody has to die in order for them to make that covenant to bind themselves unto the devil and his law because they're actually binding themselves to his law to serve him. So it's the same for us being of the covenant of Christ, of Yache. We actually have to have that, that same thing. We are binding ourselves to the covenant through Christ dying for us, not of a carnal, our brother or our sister or our friend or our child dying for us to confirm that covenant. Yache died to confirm the covenant with us for us to keep his law. So you can see the dichotomy in the world and with the devil as with Christ himself. Mm -hmm. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friends. Right. So you can see exactly what's going on when you hear things of the world of such fashion is that a covenant is actually being made. They're actually binding a covenant. Legit. Thank you for the dichotomy. <clears throat> and it's all confirmed in Hebrews 9 and 16, please. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. So someone has to die. Right. So a man always had to die for the covenant to be established. Which then makes us ask, why did the law of sacrifices get added then? If it was truly needing a man to die for the covenant. Galatians 3 and 19. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because the transgressions to the seed should come in whom the promise was made. It was added to teach us of the sacrifice Christ to come would make to establish the covenant. Galatians 3.24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Through knowing about animal sacrifice and the atonement of blood entering into the holy place, we were taught of what Christ would do, so we can understand and be justified by faith in his sacrifice in blood. Verse 25, please. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now that he has done it, we are no longer held under obligation to sacrifice animals of the order of Aaron that couldn't take away sins of person conscience. Hopefully that helps understand. The law of sacrifices that were added to the law in horror because of our father's transgressions before the first covenant was established, but truly only served as a schoolmaster to bring us unto the true offering of Christ once and for all that Paul was talking about in Galatians 3. Now let's talk about the transgression committed after the first covenant was established to which Christ died for believers in Israel's redemptions from those transgressions. Can you read Hebrews 9 and 15, please? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So Christ is not only the mediator of the New Testament. He also died to redeem the called of Israel from the transgressions of the First Testament. And by his death, he actually gives the First Testament its force so that the covenant made between our fathers and Allah Hayyam still has to be fulfilled. As we read before in Hebrews 9 and 17, that a testament is a force after men are dead. So now it's in force, seeing that he died, and now it has strength for us to fulfill it. Remember, no man died as a testator for the first covenant to make it a force, and the sacrifices were added to bring us unto Christ. So now that Christ has died, that first covenant is a force, and the obligation to fulfill the words of that covenant still has to be fulfilled. So Israel still has to obey Allah voice and do what he says in his commandments, statutes and judgments to be his people and he, our Allah so that he may fulfill the oath to our fathers and give them the land with milk and honey once our obedience is fulfilled. Also, 
by Christ's sacrifice, he redeemed those of Israel that are called to receive these promises of inheritance of the land with our fathers, as Paul was speaking of in Hebrews 9 and 15. And Isaac told Jacob and his 12 sons of before he fell asleep. Thus, the old covenant has to be fulfilled for the promises to come and the oath to the fathers to be fulfilled. And Paul never said the first covenant is actually done away when we read the scriptures. Can you read Hebrews 8 and 13, please? And that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Here we see he explained that it's old, but he didn't say it's done away. Mm -hmm. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Notice, it's decaying and getting old and ready to vanish away because the world is coming to an end, yet it's not done away or vanished as yet because it still has to be fulfilled. We can confirm the first covenant isn't done away with as well by the prophecy of it having to be fulfilled in the end of this world. Can you read Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 to 38, please? As I live, saith the Lord Ahiah, surely with the mighty hand and with the stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord Ahiah. So we will get treated just like our fathers in the wilderness, being judged face to face by Allah Hayim, after being brought out of bondage like them. Continue, please. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. He is going to bring us into the bond of the same covenant that our fathers were bound to, because obedience must be fulfilled, to fulfill the oath that our fathers made. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. Remember, man shall live by every word that proceeds from Allah Hayim. Thus, all Israel who does not fulfill the covenant to obey Ahiah's voice and do his commands, statutes, ordinances, and judgments given by Moses and his prophets, his apostles, and disciples are transgressors against him, because the words are his by the Spirit of Christ in his servants. To confirm this bond of the covenant, is not referring to the new covenant that will be made with Israel. Remember that in the new covenant, he will put his law into their hearts and minds, and they will all know Ahiah from the least to the greatest. So if the bond of the covenant was referring to the new covenant, there would be no rebels or transgressors to purge out, as all Israel would have the laws within them. Hopefully, that helps understand this bond of the covenant Israel will be brought into is the first covenant that was given. Now, let's see what will befall the rebels and transgressors of the words of the covenant. Continue, please. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am Ahiah. Just like the 600,000 footmen of Israel who were brought out of Egypt into the wilderness, who rebelled and transgressed and died there, even so, Israel in these end times will die in the wilderness and not enter the land of Israel for inheritance if they rebel and transgress the covenant. These events coming to pass will be evidence for us to know that Allah is Ahaya as well. Hopefully, that helps understand the first covenant. Though it's ready to vanish away, it has not been fulfilled as yet and will be fulfilled in the end of this world. Anything else on that before we jump forward? No, we're going to tie it together right here. All right. Understanding the new covenant. Understanding all this, we see the first covenant still has to be fulfilled, though it's old and decaying, ready to vanish away in this world. 
Now let's understand the new covenant and when it shall be. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, please. Now with the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and a true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So Yahche, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, is minister of the sanctuary and true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched in heaven, offering intercession in the presence of Allah for us. Verse 6, please. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. His ministry can purge the conscience to serve Allah and his intercession can strengthen us unto perfection. But how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. By his sacrifice, he's the mediator of a better covenant to come after this world. And this covenant was established on better promises, as he was made high priest forever by an oath, according to Hebrews 7 and 22. Let's see what that better covenant is. Hebrews 8, verse 8 through 12, please. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Confirmation that the fault in the first covenant was due to the children of Israel not continuing to obey Elohim's voice and do his words as the covenant required. Because of this fault, let's see what the new covenant will be to know the difference. Continue, but, please. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. When he said after those days, he's referring to after the days of this world. So this new covenant will be made with the house of Israel in the days of the kingdom of Christ. All right. So we're not in the new covenant yet. All right. Um, Hebrews 8 and 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a Elohim and they shall be to me a people. So the reformation of the old covenant through the blood of Christ purifies the conscience of the hearts of the house of Israel that believes unto the fulfillment of the first covenant to enjoin them into the new covenant to come in the kingdom of Christ, wherein the laws will be written in the hearts and put in their minds. The old covenant before reformation was purified and enjoined by the blood of calves and written on the tables of stone, but the reformed old covenant is purified and enjoined by the blood of Christ to make it a force through the blood of a testator for us to learn and keep Allah ways in this grace period to prepare us for the new covenant. Thus, in the kingdom of Christ under the new covenant, no one of the house of Israel would need a teacher because they all will have the law in their minds and hearts. Amen. He said he would take away the stony hearts and give us hearts of flesh. That's right. And we still have to fulfill the first covenant for us to even move on to the second. So, yeah. Let's see the perspective. And in that new covenant, what will he do? Hebrews 8 and 11, please. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful unto their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. You can confirm that that new covenant isn't established yet, because even in Hebrews, remember Paul said, let us provoke one another unto love. Mm -hmm. Let us encourage one another. So we're still here telling each other, know the Lord. <laughs> We haven't got there yet where everybody knows that we don't have to tell each other anything. If that was the case, there wouldn't be no need for the two witnesses to come. Right. You're right. They wouldn't have to come teach the people. Right. <laughs> right. It's just that you touch on that. 
<laughs> we can confirm that this must come in the kingdom of Christ because here in the end of this world, the house of Israel will still need teachers to know Ahaya. Can you read Second Baruch chapter 46, verse 2 to 5, please? And truly we shall be in darkness, and there shall be no light to the people who are left. For where again shall we seek the law? Or who will distinguish for us between death and life? So you see, these people, just as when Jerusalem was destroyed, the prophet Baruch was leaving. And we as a people understood we need prophets, we need teachers. Who is going to guide us? All right, let's see what Baruch said. And I said unto them, the throne of the mighty one I cannot resist. Nevertheless, there shall be not be wanting to Israel a wise man, nor a son of the law to the race of Jacob. But only prepare ye your hearts, that ye may obey the law, and be subject to those who in fear are wise and understanding. And prepare thy souls, that ye may not depart from them. Israel must prepare their hearts to obey the law. And be subject to those whom Ahaya will send and prepare their souls that they may not depart from them that are sent to teach them. Ahaya will send a wise man and a son of the law to preach the gospel of peace in Yache and teach all nations. Can you read Romans chapter 10 verse 4 please? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Someone has to teach them about Christ and his name so they may believe and call upon him. And prophecies confirm that because remember in Isaiah it said it's going to be a root of the stem of Jesse. A preacher has to be sent. All right. Even in Isaiah 3, it talks about how um, at the very end, there's not going to be a wise man or a man that speaks reliable words. All right. So in this ascension of Isaiah, you're talking about, I, right? I switched it, switched it to, it was Isaiah and ascension of Isaiah. I think yeah. I just put them together. Yeah. <laughs> it was Isaiah talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's consistent. A preacher has to be sent unto them. And it's funny that it's from the stem of Jesse because the preacher, <laughs> it's the house of Judah. A lawgiver shall not depart from the, between his feet. He's always going to have a seed. That's going to teach the people. Uh, Continue That's, verse 15 whenever you're ready. No, just this, this, the new covenant is, is very, it's, it's the way that they, they teach it is very deceptive because it makes every man right in his own heart and no one is circumspect to the law, conforms to the law. So it, it, you can see how it's with that false doctrine, it really gets place for the devil because only by the law. Or does it show what spirit we're walking in? If we're able to conform to Elohim's law, it shows that his spirit is in us. And if we're not able to conform to his law, it shows that another spirit is operating in us. So it's 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 very deceptive. That's true. Thankfully, we have the records to know what the prophets were admonishing us to do, to actually prepare our hearts to obey it. If Amen. you believe. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The two witnesses, a wise man and a son of the law, will be sent and empowered by Yahweh in these end times. Can you read Revelations chapter 11, verse 3, please? And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Thus, this must come to pass by promise. And Ahiah told the church he would send the two servants to help her. Can you read Second Ezra chapter 2, verse 17 to 19, please? Fear not, thou mother of the children, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord. For thy help will I send my servant Isaiah and Jeremiah, or Jeremy, after whose counsel I have sanctified and prepared for thee twelve trees laden with diverse fruits.
Their preaching of good tidings shall fill the children of the church, which are all nations that believe in Yache with joy. Can you read verse 19, please? And as many fountains flowing with milk and honey, and seven mighty mountains whereupon there grow roses and lilies, whereby I will fill thy children with joy. There's some that he said, after whose counsel I've sanctified and prepared for thee twelve trees laden with diverse fruits. And my scene is right that Allahim was so humble he took the counsel of Isaiah and Jeremiah in what to do in these end times. Could very well be so. They listen to their spirit. And that makes it to where it's truly we can really know that we can overcome because these are men that been through the world, they've had experience in life that gave advice so that we can't say, well, Allah, I'm so far above, he couldn't understand to be able to, you know, do what was needed. But he is Allah, I'm, he knew all and he counseled with those who had experience in life to give us something that would actually bring us through. That's very wise. So we know it works. We have a man in Yache who's been through this life and overcame it. And we have a, a preparation that Allah Hayyam is prophesied to do that's been counseled with men who've lived just as we live to know that it's possible and it will work because men have done it and it can be done. So Israel will need a teacher here in the end of this world by what the prophecies show to understand that the new covenant will be in the kingdom of Christ, wherein they don't need teachers anymore. Here in the end of this world, the old covenant is waxing old and getting ready to vanish as the house of Israel is being purified by faith in Yahweh's blood to turn away from the dead works, preparing their hearts to obey the law and serve Allah Hayim. And they will be brought into the bond of the first covenant in the wilderness here in these end times of this world, like we already discussed to fulfill all things. Yache spake of these things in Matthew chapter 5. Can you read Matthew 5 verse 17 and 18, please? Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Yache has to fulfill the prophecy of Ezekiel 20 to bring the remnant of the house of Israel into the bond of the first covenant. Continue, please. For verily I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So the law is not done away, and the house of Israel has to fulfill the whole law since they are called by the name, as we had heard David speak of in Gad the seer. The elect will become perfect in the law, bringing forth all the fruits of the Spirit. Can we, um, can we go into the um, ascension of Isaiah right here? Sure. Chapter 3? Yeah, how they're going to try to make void the law and the prophets so we can actually understand what's happening at the end of the world. Sure. I um, think that ties in really well. Okay. We're going to touch in the ascension of Isaiah chapter 3 to see how Ezekiel brought about the, the dichotomy of what's going on. You have believers who are going to obey the prophets and the law, believing that we need to prepare our hearts to obey the law and to cleave unto those who are wise and have understanding in these times to come and believe the prophecies that there are two witnesses that are going to be sent so that we may have a teacher, as Baruch promised that, it would be a wise man and a son of the law to guide us. On the other hand, of the children of Israel, they're also going to be those who they're going to seek to make all these things void so that those who believe can attain unto these promises. We're going to see what's going to happen by prophecy and the spirits at work that's causing this dissension and the attempt to make all these things void. If you jump in a sense of Isaiah chapter 3, Zachwar, where we start at verse 21 to 31. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, at his approach, 
His disciples will abandon the teachings of the 12 apostles and their faith and their love and their purity. And there will be much contention at his coming and at his approach. And in those days, there will be many who will love office, though lacking wisdom. And there will be many wicked elders and shepherds who wrong their sheep. And they will be rapacious because they do not have the holy shepherds. And many will exchange the glory of the robes of the saints for the robes of those who love money. And there will be much respect of persons in those days and lovers of glory of this world. And there will be many slanderers and much vain glory at the approach of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit will withdraw from many. And in those days, there will not be many prophets, nor those who speak reliable words, except one here and there in different places. Because of the spirit of error and fornication and of vainglory and of the love of money, which there would be among those who are said to be the servants of that one, and among those who received that one, and among the shepherds and the elders, there would be great hatred towards one another, for there would be great jealousy in the last days. For everyone will speak whatever pleases him in his own eyes, and they will make ineffective the prophecy of the prophets who were before me, and my visions also, and the two witnesses after me, they will make ineffective, in order that they may speak what bursts out of their own heart. You had mentioned how the 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 modern the secular teaching of the New Testament and the New Covenant being now where everyone is free to do what's according to their own heart is deceptive. Mm -hmm. Right here, we see that that's a part of what the devil is working for because every, it says for everyone will speak whatever pleases him in his own eyes. Mm -hmm. So that's set up to think we're all right in our heart and he knows our heart and we have the new covenant that the laws are in our heart so we can just it justifies us. Yeah. It's Instead of conforming ourselves to Elohim's law and obeying his voice and walking in his ways. Yeah. Instead of preparing our hearts to obey the law like we were told. Mm -hmm. And all that Yache said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. But on the other side, the elders and teachers to come in these end times, they will make ineffective the prophecy of the prophets. They're going to teach things that are going to seek to make the prophecies ineffective, to make people not believe them so it's not effective for them, though the prophecies will still come to pass. But we get to understand the, the war in the house of Israel that's to come. They're not going to conform to the law. I mean, you're going to have at the end of the day, they're not going to want to keep the commandments to be under the covenant of Yahweh. They're not going to want to be under the reformed old covenant. They're above the law, so to speak. But unfortunately, they're not above the law. They're just walking in another law. Which we see which is going to be full of vainglory. <laughs> it's going to be full of fornication and error, um, love of money. You know, they're, it says they're going to wrong their own sheep. They're going to love office, though lacking wisdom. Because our wisdom is in the law. Yeah. To depart from evil is wisdom, as Trump right. said. So you can see they have to they're they're walking in the in the spirit of the, the, the devil, though they feel like they're walking in the spirit of Alahim, and that's gonna be the great deception.
unfortunate through the lack of understanding the truth of the gospel the lack of humility amen but the Allahian walks in humility and even in the law it teaches you to to um to be um disciplined like keeping the sabbath like you have to abstain from doing your own will you have to abstain from doing things that you may find pleasure in because it's teaching you humility and it's teaching you um obedience right we're learning you we learn obedience through the law So, you know, <laughs> you actually became obedient unto death by obeying the voice of Allah. I am every word that proceeded from his mouth. If you will, we have here, this isn't the first time this happened to us. Our pride in ourselves to think it's okay. We're able to do these things because we are the children of Allah. I am because we are the children of Israel in Jeremiah seven. Verse 8 to 10, he said, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other Allahim, whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? Even back then, we thought we were delivered to do as we will. Yeah. Unfortunately, we he has said in verse 4, Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of Ahaya, the temple of Ahaya, the temple of Ahaya are these. We thought we as a people were his temple, and we could do no wrong. So, Praise Allah for understanding of what's at hand here. And thankfully, in the midst of all this, he actually said he all things must be fulfilled. Did you have anything else, Akbar? No, I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. And the prophecies show, though it's going to be, you see the dichotomy of what's going to happen in the house of Israel. Those that believe and seek to prepare their hearts to obey the law and submit to it and submit to the teachers that Ahaya will send and those who seek to freedom to do as they will through the spirits of error, fornication and vainglory and the love of money yet the remnant will believe and be preserved can you read Jeremiah 50 verse 20 please in those days and in that time saith Ahaya the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Notice, <clears throat> he will pardon them whom he reserves. You have in the wilderness the rebels or transgressors are going to get purged out. But those whom he reserves, they will be pardoned. Those who are reserved at 144,000 spoken of in Revelation and being pardoned, they shall be without fault before Allah Hayyam in the end of this world. Can you read Revelation chapter 7 verse 4 and then chapter 14 verse 5 and 4, please? Revelation chapter 7 verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Revelation 14 and 5. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of Elohim. They will be clothed in the twelve holy spirits to be faultless, not being defiled with the twelve evil women in black as followers of the Lamb in truth. You can reference Shepherd of Hermas to understand the twelve holy spirits and the twelve women in black. Continue in verse 4, please. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. 
These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto Elohim and to the Lamb. For the house of Israel, Yacha admonishes them not to break the law, lest they do not enter into the kingdom for their hypocrisy. Can you read Matthew chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, please? Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The righteousness of the Pharisees is hypocrisy, to say and not do. Thus, this must not be found in the men of the house of Israel, who will be brought into the bond of the covenant in the wilderness, because rebels and transgressors will be purged out, as we discussed earlier. This is necessary to purify the church as well. Can you read Hermas Parable 9, chapter 18, verse 3 and 4, please? And if thou sawest the stones removed from the tower and delivered over to the evil spirits, they too shall be cast out. Those evil spirits are the twelve evil women in black, and the hundred and forty-four thousand will not be defiled with. Okay. And there shall be one body of them that are purified, just as the tower, after it had been purified, became made as it were one stone. Thus shall it be with the church of Elohim also, after she hath been purified, and the wicked and the hypocrites and blasphemers and double-minded, and they that commit various kinds of wickedness have been cast out. This will come to pass when Israel is brought under the bond of the covenant to purge out the rebels and transgressors like the ones aforementioned. Okay. When these have been cast out, the church of Elohim shall be one body, one understanding, one mind, one faith, one love. And then the son of Elohim shall rejoice and be glad in them, for that he hath received back his people pure. Great and glorious, sir, say I, are all these things. This purging of the church, casting out the unbelievers of Israel, is prophecy, wherein the 144,000 will be a humble people that trust in Ahiah and do no iniquity. Can you read Zephaniah 3, 11 to 13, please? In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. They will be pardoned, so they won't be ashamed being without fault before the throne. That's the faith they're going to have, <laughs> believing in Yache. They have an atonement. Continue, please. Right. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. We saw how fornication, vainglory, love of money, and the spirit of error was going to be found in Israel in these end times. Baha'i is going to take it out from the midst of us, or the midst of the house of Israel. Lord willing, we be, I be a part of this number that gets saved. Under the bond of the covenant, the transgressors and rebels who rejoice in the pride and haughtiness will be taken away. Continue, please. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of Ahia. Those who are afflicted in themselves to change and humbled by obedience, preparing their hearts to obey the law and submit into that process of getting to that humility to do it, shall trust in Ahia, knowing his loving kindness delivered them, not themselves, as it was him working in them. Continue, please. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. That's 144K who are virgins. They are going to get to that perfection. All right. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. They will enter the kingdom. The house of Israel that makes it through the wilderness, being brought into the bond of the first covenant, will bud forth before the false prophet. Apocalypse of Peter, chapter 2, please. Have thou not understood that the fig tree is the house of Israel? Verily I say unto thee, when the twigs thereof have sprouted forth in the last days, 
Then shall fain Christ come and awake expectation, saying, I am the Christ, that am now come into the world. And when they, Israel, shall perceive the wickedness of their deeds, they shall turn away after them and deny him, whom our fathers did praise, even the first Christ whom they crucified, and therein sinned a great sin. This is the purging of the house of Israel, when the unbelievers will turn after their own wicked deeds and worship the false prophet, while the true house of Israel will bud forth and deny him. Continue, please. But this deceiver is not the Christ. And when they reject him, he shall slay with the sword, and there shall be many martyrs. Then shall the twigs of the fig tree, that is the house of Israel, shoot forth. Many shall become martyrs at his hand. Enoch and Elias shall be sent to teach them that this is the deceiver which must come into the world and do signs and wonders to deceive. It says Enoch and Elias shall be sent to teach them. Right. Israel still needs teachers. Right. So that not in the new covenant. <laughs> right. That shows even when the false prophet comes, it's the same old covenant. Israel being taught. The two witnesses will be there amongst the elect of Israel, teaching the house of Israel to confirm that even at that time of the false prophet isn't the time of the new covenant yet. All right. And therefore shall they that die by his hand be martyrs, and shall be reckoned among the good and righteous martyrs who have pleased Elohim in their life. Amen. And mm -hmm. the two witnesses they refer to as Enoch and Elias, because Enoch and Elias, they ascended, they didn't die. The two witnesses, they're also going to ascend, as you read in Revelations 11. The house of Israel that are found faithful in these times will please Allah in their life and will partake in the new covenant of Christ in the kingdom of Christ, all having the laws in their minds and written on their hearts so that they all would no longer need a teacher, but every man will know Ahaya and be his people. Can you read Gad the Seer chapter 2 verse 8 to 13, please? And in the end of days, the sower shall be true, and the seed shall be true. And from the seed, all the land will be blessed. Be joyful and glad, remnant of Judah, and rejected of Israel, for salvation is with Ahia. They shall be glad, because the remnant shall make it into the bond of the covenant and bud forth before the false prophet. As ye shall be accursed and blasphemy to all the families of the earth, so shall ye be a blessing in grace forever. The remnant of Israel will be a blessing because their endurance against sin and sacrifice in the end will fulfill all things to bring about salvation in the end of the world. Since Yahweh won't come, revenge all disobedience until their repentance and obedience is fulfilled. At that time, no curse to unholy people will be found among you. This is in the kingdom under the new covenant. All Israel will be blessed and holy, all having the laws in their hearts and minds. For everyone will join you in the covenant of the law, testimony, statutes, and ordinances. All nations in the kingdom will join them in the covenant. And here you have confirmation that the covenant will still contain the law, testimonies, statutes, and ordinances. Right? And you and they shall have one Elohim, one covenant, one law, one language. For all shall speak in the Jews' language, the holy language. The Gentiles will join the house of Israel in the covenant in the kingdom of Christ to learn of Ahaya. While the elect, that is the house of Israel, will all know Ahaya and not sin. Enoch prophesied of how the children of Israel will be perfect as the new covenant showed in the kingdom. Enoch chapter 5, verse 7 to 9, please. But for the elect, there shall be light and joy and peace, and they shall inherit the earth. And then there shall be bestowed upon the elect wisdom, and then they shall all live and never again sin, either through unholiness or through pride. But they who are wise shall be humble. 
and they shall not again transgress, nor shall they sin all the days of their life, nor shall they die of the divine anger or wrath, but they shall complete the number of the days of their life, and their lives shall be increased in peace. And the years of their joy shall be multiplied in eternal gladness and peace all the days of their life. Scriptures also confirm in Christ's kingdom, when the Gentiles join the Jews in the new covenant, the Gentiles will be enlightened with the knowledge of the law too. Testament of Levi, chapter 18, verse 8, please. And there shall none succeed him for all generations forever. That's because Christ is high priest after the order of Melchizedek forever by an oath. Let's see what that oath was real quick. Psalms 110, okay. verse 4, please. And Ahiah hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right. Hebrews 6 and 20. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Yahche made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right. And Testament of Levi, chapter 18, verse 9, please. And in his priesthood, the Gentiles shall be multiplied in knowledge upon the earth and enlightened through the grace of the Lord. Paul started that process by enlightening the Gentiles of the gospel when you read chapter 10 of the Testament of Benjamin. Continue, please. In his priesthood shall sin come to an end, and the lawless shall cease to do evil, and the just shall rest in him. Believers of all nations in his kingdom will make sin come to an end, and people who believe will cease from sin. All right. So you have understanding of the new covenant to come and the old covenant that's ready to vanish away, but has been reformed so that we can keep it here in the times when the bond of the covenant is established. Now, who does the covenant belong to? Let's see Barnabas' explanation. Barnabas chapter 13, verse 6, please. Mark in whose cases he ordained that this people should be first in era of the covenant. Chapter 14. Let's read it, please. Barnabas chapter 14, verse 1. Yea, verily, but as regards the covenant which he swore to the fathers to give it to the people, let us see whether he hath actually given it. He hath given it, but they themselves were not found worthy to receive it by reason of their sins. For the prophet saith, and Moses was fasting in Mount Sinai forty days and forty nights, that he might receive the covenant of Ahio to give to the people. And Moses received from Ahia the two tables which were written by the finger of the hand of Elohim in the spirit. And Moses took them and brought them down to give them to the people. And Ahia said to Moses, 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 come down quickly. For thy people whom thou lettest forth from the land of Egypt have done wickedly. And Moses perceived that they had made for themselves again molten images. And he cast them out of his hand, and the tables of the covenant of Ahio were broken in pieces. Moses received them, but they themselves were not found worthy. So the covenant received by Moses was on tables of stone, like we formerly learned. And Israel broke it, being unworthy to receive the covenant because of their sins. Yet after this, the father charged Yache to deliver Israel from darkness of their sins and make a holy people of them unto himself. Continue, please. For it is written how the father charged him to deliver us from darkness and to prepare a holy people for himself. Therefore, saith the prophet, Ahia the Elohim called thee in righteousness and will lay hold of thy hand and will strengthen thee. And I have given thee to be a covenant of the race, a light to the Gentiles, to open the eyes of the blind and to bring forth them that are bound from their fetters and them that sit in darkness from their prison house. We perceived then whence we were ransomed. So Yachi had to be a covenant for the race of the house of Israel, 
and also a light to the Gentiles, opening the eyes of all nations to bring everyone out of the prison of darkness and sin to make Israel a holy people unto himself. Now, in regards to the covenant, let's see what this means for the believers of the house of Israel. Okay. But how did we receive them? He is speaking on how the believers of Israel have received the covenant. Okay. Mark this. Moses received them being a servant, but the Lord himself gave them to us to be the people of his inheritance, having endured patiently for our sakes. There you see the understanding. You remember we talked about how Moses was the mediator, but then Yachi replaced him as the mediator. Barnabas given the same understanding. The Lord himself is now given the same covenant to the people. All right. Lord Yache has given the covenant to the house of Israel that believe in him to be a people of his inheritance. Yache being made manifest in the flesh served two purposes in regards to the house of Israel. Continue, please. But he was made manifest. In order that the same time they might be perfected in their sins, and we might receive the covenant through him who inherited it, even the Lord Yahche. So there you have for the house of Israel on one end, it's for perfecting the sins of the unbelievers, and also for the believers to receive the covenant through him who inherited it. So Lord Yahche himself was made manifest to fill up the sins of the unbelieving Israelites who wouldn't believe on him and give the covenant that he inherited from the father to be his sacrifice to the people of Israel who would believe on him. Let's see how he established this covenant with the believers of Israel. Continue verse five, please. We might receive the covenant through him who inherited it, even the Lord Yahweh, who was prepared beforehand thereunto that appearing in person he might redeem out of darkness our hearts, which had already been paid over unto death and delivered up to the iniquity of error, and thus established the covenant in us through the word. He redeemed the believers of the house of Israel out of the darkness of their hearts by his sacrifice and gave them his covenant by the preaching of the word to establish the covenant in the hearts and minds of the believing Israelites through the preaching of the word that they may be the people of his inheritance. This covenant is preparing Israel for the new covenant to come in the kingdom of Christ. So Yahche had to be a covenant for the race of the house of Israel and also a light to the Gentiles, opening the eyes of all nations and bringing everyone out of the prison of sin. Continue, please. Again, the prophet saith, Behold, I have set thee to be a light unto the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Thus saith Ahiah, that ransomed thee, even Elohim. So Christ offered himself for the sins of many, to be a covenant of the race of Israel, and a light to the Gentiles, to be the salvation for the earth. And as many as believe and look for him to come back, he shall be their salvation. Hebrews 9 and 28, please. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The Gentiles that come to the light of Christ in this world, believing on him, will take hold of the covenant too in preparation for the kingdom, as we touched on in Isaiah 56 and 6. From before. Um, so it's important for strangers that join themselves unto Ahiah by faith in Yache's blood to serve him, to keep the Sabbath, and take hold of the covenant of Yache. Ahiah is gathering the house of Israel and the righteous Gentiles unto him. Can you read Isaiah 56 and 8, please? The Lord Ahiah with gathereth the outcast of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him. Besides those that are gathered unto him. In the kingdom, all will have one law, one covenant, and one Elohim. As we read before in Gadesia chapter 2, verse 12, let's close out with it, please. 
for everyone will join you in the covenant and the law, testimony, statutes, and ordinances. And you and they shall have one Elohim, one covenant, one law, one language. For all shall speak in the Jews' language, the holy language. Right. Hopefully, this has all been edifying to understand the first covenant, the first testament, the New Testament, the renewal or the reformation of the old covenant that is to be fulfilled here in these end times as the house of Israel is going to be brought under the bond of that covenant and that the Gentiles are going to take hold of that covenant, trusting in Ahaya and also the dissension to come in the house of Israel, wherein through Christ's sacrifice and manifesting himself in the flesh, it's going to bring the unbelievers of Israel to the fullness of their sin and these end times where they're going to seek to speak whatever burst out of their own hearts and not obey the voice of Ahaya, while believers will receive the inheritance of the covenant that was given to Christ by preparing their hearts to obey the law and cleave to those that are wise and have understanding, knowing that Allah will send a wise man and the son of the law and the two witnesses to guide the people and teach them so that they can obey Allah and so that they can know when the false prophet comes not to listen to him. And that in the kingdom, the new covenant will be established where all nations will have one law, one Allah, one covenant, one language, speaking the holy language of Hebrew. Anything else, Zakwa? Nope. That's good. Praise Allah. Hope everybody enjoyed the lesson. If you have any questions, please send us an email at HebrewReaders at gmail.com. Make sure you check out the website, HebrewReaders.com. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit the bell so that you can receive notifications when we drop any new videos. And we hope that you are growing in the faith of Yache and learning and truly putting forth the work in your own life to grow and to prosper according to Allah. Amen. Hope you enjoyed the law class. Catch you on the next one. Tell them, everybody. Tell them. HRC, 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 Hebrew Reader, Hebrew Reader, Hebrew Reader Church.